and we are very proud to sponsor what is our fourth uh, lecture on of public interest to a, an audience that is certainly interested in public affairs and we are more than proud to have with us this evening Rabbi Beryl Wine who will be our guest lecturer this evening. Thank you for coming Rabbi Wine and for bringing your family. Before the speaker comes to the platform, I'd like to say a word about the sponsoring organization because many of you, even among my closest friends here, are not quite sure what this organization is all about. And we have a brief film strip which will explain something about the organization. I think perhaps we will show that first. If you have been at our earlier lectures, you may have seen it already. I hope you don't mind seeing it again. If you do, it's only eight minutes. Obviously, we'll remain nameless. Does not live in Jerusalem, lives in the city in the south. Has three children and found herself with her fourth pregnancy, a very unwanted pregnancy. Her husband was unemployed or is unemployed. She had decided that she would have an abortion. She talked with her Rebbitzin about it. The Rebbitzin handled it very well and tactfully and referred her to us. We interviewed her. We saw that there was financial need, and that was the basic reason why she had decided to have an abortion. We offered to help. For the few hundred shekels a month, and making up her lapsed kupat cholim, we were able to help her to choose what she herself wanted to do, and that is to have her baby. Today I got a call from this woman. She is in her 41st week. Uh, it's just a week beyond. Her doctor wants to induce the birth. And she went to the hospital to do so. And the hospital discovered that there's a 400 shekel debt outstanding from the last baby. And they would not take her. What's more, she needed a ktav hitchaivut from Kupat Cholim. You know what they are. And when she went to Kupat Cholim to get the Ketav Yitchaibut to have the inducement done, they said, wait, there's a 600 shekel debt. It's true, you brought yourself up to date, which is what we had done, but you haven't paid since. And of course, the reason she hadn't paid since is because she needed food on the table. So there was a need for a thousand shekel in order for this woman, now beyond her ninth month, to have her baby. Is there anyone here who has the slightest doubt what we're going to do? This is a Jewish baby, a Jewish life, that would not have been born except for earlier contributors to Just One Life. We are not making an appeal this evening. However, if you'd like to help us now or in the future, you have the cards, you have our address, and we are going to need volunteers. If you live in Israel, and especially if you speak Hebrew, we can occasionally use volunteer help one-on-one -on -one with women, both in Yerushalayim and all over the country. The card in your envelope provides for a check-off if you have the time to volunteer. Please be in touch with us, because this is a mitzvah that we'd love to share with everybody else. I'd like to acknowledge the presence here this evening before we proceed to the main dish, of our counseling coordinator, Madeline Gittleman. Would you rise and take a bow? She is responsible for, I don't know, how many hundreds of Jewish children in Israel. Okay, she is uh, in her usual love profile, I'm saying. But Madeline, I'm glad that you're here. And I'm glad that you're with us. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge the presence of our executive director from New York, the source of all funds for most funds for Just One Life. Uh, you know that uh, there are those in the charity fields who think that the bracha ought to be hamotzi lechem mechutzaaretz. In any event, 
the one who supplies us with much of the lechem that finds its way to the tables of our clients is Rabbi Martin Katz, Executive Director of Just One Life and formerly Executive Director of the Lincoln Square Synagogue. We stole him from there. And he's doing a wonderful job for us. Marty, would you bring us greetings for a moment from New York? <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi Gordon. I'm under strict orders. Uh, Rabbi Gordon passed a piece of paper to me while I was on the telephone. He said, Marty, no solicitations tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I've been here for the last four and a half weeks. Uh, my trip began with a two-day conference in the Nefesh Achat office, which several people from the states came to, and several people from Israel. Uh, we've been working quite diligently to launch several major, several campaigns, both uh, in the United States and in Israel. Uh, I just uh, reiterate the repeat. Uh, Baruch Hashem, as you noticed, you walked in, each of you signed uh, a pad. We are developing a, a mailing list, a membership list. Uh, I repeat again what Rabbi Gordon had said, if everybody could please kindly fill it out. We're going to be putting together several newsletters and hopefully keeping everybody uh, up to date about what's going on uh, with the work of what I consider to be a very unique and special uh, organization. Uh, on the other side of the coin, Hamotzi Lechem Mi Chutz Laaretz, if any of you, first of all, if anybody here is from the States, or if anybody knows of anybody in the States who possibly could get involved, uh, certainly we welcome it, uh, and thank you again. Thank you, Martin. Commercials are over. <laughs> And now to the very pleasurable part of the evening, and nothing affords more pleasure in Jewish tradition than learning. One of the most serious topics, and indeed a halachic topic, of our times of recent years, is that which concerns a very sensitive area, ben adam lechavero, an interpersonal area which has strong halachic ramifications. Confidentiality. Of course, everyone is supposed to keep a secret, and no one is supposed to talk Lashon Hara. But there are certain individuals, doctors, attorneys, not least of whom rabbis, who are given confidences that must be kept for professional and personal as well as halachic reasons. The degree and the extent to which a confidence is sacred is a truly timely halachic legal topic and deserves the attention of audiences who are interested and concerned for the application of Jewish principle to contemporary life. We have that topic this evening, and we have with us an individual whose expertise in many areas of halacha, and not least of them this, is a sine qua non. Rabbi Wein, an attorney himself, is a Rav, is a Rosh Hashiva, is a historian, and I can tell you from experience, is a fascinating speaker. Those of you who have heard his wonderful tapes on Jewish history, or who have attended his lectures here in Yerushalayim over recent weeks, know what is in store, and know the seriousness with which the subject will receive the treatment that it deserves. Greatly honored to call to the dais and to the microphone, Rabbi Beryl Wein. I wish 
to thank Rabbi Gordon for his very generous introduction. I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I met someone today and he said, I saw Rabbi Wine that you're speaking tonight. What are you going to say? So I told him it's confidential. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that uh, any discussion of these types of subjects uh, runs great risks. My uh, Rebbe in the yeshiva many years ago said that if you speak publicly about snews, then it's not so new anymore. There is a degree of uh, delicacy and of intimacy and of good common sense that has always governed the Jewish people. In our time, due to the breakdown of many, many barriers in society generally, those barriers have been broken, unfortunately, within the Jewish people as well. And that really cuts across the grain of uh, all types of observant Jews and less observant Jews, and even those who call themselves secular Jews. Uh, we live in a society where none of these things are sacred. We live in a society that advocates freedom of the press. Freedom of the press means that you can literally publish almost anything. And we are witness to the havoc that is wrought in society. And by having not only a free press, but an uninhibited, scandal-mongering, almost inventive type of press. So when we come tonight to discuss a topic in halacha, the topic of professionalism and confidentiality, I think it's very important for us to bear in mind that whatever I do say, there is much more that I will not say. And that in order to truly understand the subject, I don't think it's as important to understand what I do say as much as it is to understand what I don't say. Now, I've been trying to train my Balabatim and Munsi for 20 years to understand what I don't say. <laughs> Well, that's always part of the struggle between a Rav and his community. And I hope, therefore, that uh, our rapport this evening will be just sufficient quality that you'll be able to understand the nuances as well. The Torah of the Jewish people is a Torah of balance, a point that is also often forgotten in our society. There is a balance in life. The ways of the Torah are pleasantness. And all of its highways, all of its byways lead to harmony. The Rambam said the great golden rule of Jewish life, that there's a golden mean, and that one should always attempt to you, to that golden mean. If one finds that one veers too much to the right or to the left, then one has to balance it by moving to the other side. But the goal is to be in the middle, to be balanced. The Rambam says there are only two exceptions to that rule. One is anger, and the second is humility. Those are the only two areas in which one is allowed to be an extremist. One can be extremely modest, as I am, <laughs> and one is allowed, as Hillel was, to force himself never to be brought to anger. Those are the two extremes that are allowed in Jewish life. But otherwise, there really is no room for extremes. The Torah is the Torah of balance. In a very unbalanced world, so in order to keep our equilibrium, we also are sometimes unbalanced. 
but we should realize that that's only a horat shah, that's only a temporary expedient in order to allow us to survive. For the Jewish people to prosper, for the Torah to reach the masses of Israel, for the Torah to play the point of perfection in a person's life, then there has to be balance. And the interesting thing about halacha, anyone who has studied the Shilas and Shuvas of the great Poskin from the time of the Gaoni until our time, will see that each and every question is basically a question of balance. We all know what the law is. The question is, how do we apply the law to this circumstance, to this person, to this time, to this event, so that it comes out balanced. And the Torah it says, Ve'osiso ha-yoshor v'hatov v'enei Hashem alokecha. What does God want from you? So God tells you, you should do what's right and good in my eyes. V'enei Hashem alokecha. So our rabbis in the Gemara took that posuk and they said, well, they can't apply to the Shulchan Aruch because the Shulchan Aruch is straight. Why would God come? He already said that you're going to do all the mitzvahs. So God is telling us something else, an extra dimension. The extra dimension is called Lifnim Mishura Sadim. That God insists that we do more than the letter of the law. The Talmud says during these three weeks of mourning, the Talmud says that one of the reasons that the temple was destroyed is everybody insisted on their rights. Nobody wanted more than their rights. But everybody insisted on his rights. I have the uh, honor and pleasure a number of times a day to cross Rehov Ramban at the corner of our Lazarus, where everybody insists on their rights. <laughs> you can wait years and never get across. So whenever I'm there, I always think of that. She ain't Latzman al Din Torah. Everybody said, you know, it's my, I'm not going to wait, it's, I'm here. He's right. But society cannot survive that way. Eventually, they'll have to put up a traffic light. Something will have to happen. Society exists only when people are willing to give up on their rights. When people are willing to be forthcoming to others. When people say, please, you go first. Now, I know that New York is good training for Israel. In fact, I think that that's why God invented it. I can think of no other reason for its existence. But one of the hallmarks of large city urban life is the fact that people are not really forthcoming to each other. And much of the degradation that exists in Western civilization today stems from that simple idea that there's no Lifnim Meshur Asadim. Well, how shall we define Lifnim Meshur Asadim? So the Gemara tells us a great story. The Gemara tells us that there was a great Rav in Bovel, and he hired workers, the Gemara in Bambatsiya, he hired workers to move barrels of wine from one part of his machsan to another part. Well, the workers came, and they were unemployed, and they were a little uh, not too adept. And they took his barrels of wine, and they moved them from one corner to the other, and they broke a few barrels. He came down, he saw the mess that they made, the damages that he suffered. So he confiscated the clothing that they wore when they came to the job. They came in their uh, dress clothing, like everyone in Israel wears. 
and then they changed into clothing for moving the barrels. So he confiscated their good clothing in, uh, as a collateral for the damages that he had suffered before he could take them to court. He brought them before the great Rav. And so he told his story. And they said, yeah, you know, the barrels were heavy. We didn't mean it. You know, it dropped. And meanwhile, he took our clothes away. So Rob said to him, you took their clothes away, give them back their clothes. They need their clothes. What do you mean you took their clothes away? So he said to him, Dino Hoche. You know, don't, I'm a big Talmud Chochem. That's the din. The din is that I can hold their clothes. So he told them, in, yes, Dino Hoche. I'm telling you, Rapsak Aloche. That's the din. Give them back their clothes. The workers were emboldened. They saw that they won. So they said, wait a minute, the case is not over. He hired us. We were supposed to get 10 shekels for doing it. We worked all day. Now we have to go home to our wives and our families. We don't have an agura in our pocket. We want our money. So Rav said, you're right. He said to him, pay him. Pay him for the day's labor. So he said to him, Dino Hoche, what is with you? That's the din. That I, not only did they cause me damages, I have to pay him for the day yet. Omer le Sarab said to him, In, yes, Dino Hoche, that's the din, pay him. So he paid him. When the workers left, he said, Show it to me in the book. What did you do to me here? Why do I have to pay him? Why did you give him back the clothes? So Rav told him, You have to do what's right. In your case, you're a great Talmud Chacham, you represent Torah. They're poor people. They have nowhere to eat from. The right thing is you pay them. You give them the money. That's what God would do. That's what Sisa Yosher told. That ability to be able to understand that in every set of circumstances the guiding rule of halacha is v'yosiso ha'yoshor v'atov b'nei Hashem alokecha. We want to do what's right. We want to do what God kaviyochal would have nachas from. And that's the greatness of all of the poskim. My friends, what makes a person a POSIC? So you'll say, well, he has a 180 IQ and he has a photographic memory and he learned in the yeshiva for 25 years. All of that is true, but that doesn't make a POSIC. The Gemara says, what makes a POSIC? So the Gemara says, a POSIC on Dovid HaMelech. The POSIC says, Hashem Imo, the Lord was with him. So the Gemara says, what did it mean the Lord was with him? So we would say the Lord was with him, right? He buys AT&T stock, it goes up 60 points. He buys a building, real estate goes up. He's a smart man. The Gemara says, no, Hashem Nemo, Halocha Kemoso Bechol Mokom. Whenever he says the Halocha, that is the Halocha. So the halacha is not only dependent upon genius. There are many great geniuses in the Jewish world who are not poskim, my friends. There are many people who know the Talmud thoroughly, and they are not poskim. Poskim is a gift that's given from heaven. Hashem Imo, God is with him. What does it mean, God is with him? He, Kaviyochel, is able to read God's mind. What does God want in this given case? In our generation, we have such people. In the previous generation, we had such people. I was privileged to, uh, uh, on a number of occasions, to be with Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zechot Tzadik Levrocha. And one saw it. One saw it in front of his eyes. 
that it's not just the knowledge of where to look it up in the Shulchan Aruch that makes a pose. It was Hashem Imo. I once had a Shiloh with him, a terrible question that arose yet while I was at in Miami Beach about a child that was, according to the great Rabbi Wine, was certainly a mamzer al pi halochet. And how was he, that boy ever going to get married? And how was it ever going to work out? And I didn't know what to do. So I took a plane. I went up to New York. I went to Ramesh's apartment on the east side. And I sat down with him. And I told it to him. And I was very agitated. And he was calm as only a great man can be calm. A man that carries the Jewish people on his back. I share you so homen as Ionic. A man who heard more Tsaurus in one day than any person can survive, and he was able to take it. So he put his hand on my hand. So to me, I, I called him Ramation. He called me Rabbi Wine. How do you like that, right? <laughs> I don't know yet why. And he worked it out. It took years he worked it out, and he wasn't the mom's there, and he isn't. I saw Hashem Imo, Mamash Ruach HaKadosh. God was with him. Because that's the Asisa HaYoshor V'Atov Bene Hashem Alakecha. To do what's right, to do what's good. That is the hallmark of Jewish life. If one remembers that, and it's hard to remember, because sometimes we are so absorbed, you know, in religion that we don't hear God. It's very easily done. If you remember, the blessing of Jews in Eastern Europe was that God was real. He was in their house. He was part of them. That's what the Jewish people always had. That the Rabboni Shalom was not an abstract idea was a presence within us. Well, if we're able to remember that, so then we have this gift of balance, which enables us to be a people of the Torah, people of greatness, people who are stronger than anything else in the world, and whose faith can never be shaken because of our understanding of who stands? Me, Omeid, Achar, Kosleinu. Who stands behind us? Whom do we serve? With that uh, perhaps overly lengthy introduction, I want to say a few words about professionalism and then to conclude by saying a few words about confidentiality. The interesting thing that I always find in Halacha, and I always find in the Gemara, is that there's no separate Gemara for rabbis. There's no separate Shulchan Aruch for rabbis, for Rosh Yeshiva, for Bnei Yeshiva, for Talmidei Chachomim, for the garbage collector, for the street cleaner. Torah Achas Yelochem. There's only one Torah. Rabbi Gordon uh, mentioned the uh, problems of professionalism uh, with doctors, with lawyers. That's because of the Western mindset that we have, that our Jewish mothers have given us. You know, that we have to be a professional. And our definition of a professional is a doctor, a lawyer, maybe an accountant. <laughs> I, uh, if I may steal a story from my wife, it's not the only thing I take from her, is that uh, we, in our shul, we had a very, very fine man that was the president of the shul for a number of years. And he was a great Talmud Chochem, and he spoke marvelously every time he got up to make the announcements. So he was so good that I got rid of him. <laughs> but he was really great. And he had a mother-in-law, you know, from mother-in-law land. He had a real schmigger. 
And so one Shabbos she came to Shul and he got up and he spoke and it was just absolutely beautiful and gorgeous and the right words at the right time. And so my wife in her true uh, Rebetzin form said to his mother-in-law, she said, you know, your son-in-law, he could have been a rabbi. So she looked at him, she said, a rabbi, he could have been a doctor. <laughs> grateful that he's neither. <laughs> but that's our understanding of professional. But in halacha we don't find that. We find only in one respect that a professional is different than anyone else. And that's in the field of malpractice. Because in halacha, if you hold yourself out to be a professional, so then you take on certain responsibilities, which in our society is called malpractice. And the interesting thing in Aloha, just to digress for one more moment, the interesting thing is that if you charge money, then the Torah says you are protected almost, you're almost immune from malpractices. Because otherwise the Gemara says who would ever be a doctor, who would ever do anything, right? That's your profession. So uh, we'll protect you short of gross negligence. But if you give free advice, you go to a bar mitzvah, and the person next to you says, you know, my ear bothers me. And you say to him, you know, well, why don't you take this pill? It's terrific. He takes the pill, he breaks out in hives. The halacha is that you're chayev. You're, you can, he can sue you. That's malpractice. Who are you to tell him to take a pill? But aside from malpractice, we do not find different standards for professionals as for laymen, as for artisans or workers or anyone else. And the attitude in professionalism, if I may sum it up in a few rules, number one is punctuality. There's such a thing as Jewish time in the world. It's not to be proud of. Time is the only thing in life that is not replaceable. Everything else, everything else can be regained, even health. Chazal, uh, they rather the Bali Musser had a poem that they used to sing in the Musser Stiebel. I heard it many times yet in the Shiva in Chicago, the, the Mashgiach Rabbi Wernick used to sing it. I, uh, if I could sing, I would be perfect. So I cannot sing it for you. But I hear it in my ears. But uh, the words are very famous. The words are Odom Doeg Al Ibu Domov. A man worries, a person worries about the loss of his wealth. Veino Doeg Al Ibu Yomov. And he does not worry about the loss of his days, of time. Doma Veino Mozrim. His wealth eventually will not help him. His days never returned. Time is the most valuable of all commodities. It is not to be wasted. I think that simply one of the uh, sad points of our society is the idiom that we use, the kill time, la roga tazman. Time is not here to be killed. A professional time means something. For everyone it means something. Service is rendered. The Gemara says that if workers are hired to harvest, let's say, uh, dates, and they're at the top of a palm tree, and it's time for Kriyashma. So the Gemara has a whole halacha that they should say Kriyashma up there. Can't take off time to daven. The Gemara has a different benching for workers. You can't take off time to bench. You're working for somebody. He's paying you by the hour. He has to pay you. You have to work honestly. In a society of the balance of the Torah, one does not need the histadrut, nor labor unions, nor management councils, nor all of the apparatus that exists in the Western world today to try and govern our commercial society. 
services rendered, to do one's best at all times. Fair price, that's a professional. Professionalism is to charge fairly. Umara has many concerns about pricing. And it's very difficult to judge what is a fair price. But most people deep in their hearts know what it is. Most people know when they're being gouged. Most people know when they overcharge. Most people know when things are done wrongly. A professional is vasisa hayoshor v'atov v'nei Hashem alokecha. What would God take for the job, so to speak? What would he say? I have to say publicly that one of the finest experiences that I've had in my lifetime, I had here in Eretz Yisrael, near Shalayim, when uh, my wife and I came here a number of weeks ago, last year when we were here and we began to furnish our apartment, uh, we purchased some carpeting from a fine Iranian Jew here on Rehov Yafo. And we made up a price and we gave him the money and he installed it, it was fine, good. This year we came back, so we decided we're going to try and see maybe there's one more area that needs a rug. We're going to look for a rug. So we walk in the store. Walk in the store, he runs to me. He says, Rav Vine, he said, I'm looking for you the whole year. I said, uh-oh. Now what happened? Checked in clear. Why is he looking for me? He said, Ayiti, etzlacha, kama v'kama pami, main kol ve'none. I rang your bell, nobody answers. He takes out of his wallet. He has it wrapped in a rubber band. He has 55 shekel with a note. And he said, I overcharged you to 55 shekel last year. He said, I'm so happy that you're here. So he put the 55 shekel away. So he wouldn't spend it. It's sitting in his wallet with my petek on it. That's for Sisa Tova Yoshi. That's, what's do that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be wow. That's the way it should be. That's the world that the Torah envisioned for us. That's the balance of doing what's right. And finally, we have this topic of confidentiality. In our time, when every word that is said everywhere in the world is leaked, uh, where the whole uh, structure of society is built upon the right to know. Who says that you have a right to know? That's a given in our society. I have a right to know, you know, George Bush's... Uh, why do I have to know? I mean, why? What gave me the right to know? It's interesting how society has changed. Franklin Roosevelt was President of the United States, the only man elected to four terms of office. He was a cripple. He was in a wheelchair. He could barely stand, and when he stood, he stood with enormous steel braces and was propped up. And it never once was reported in the press in the United States. You never saw a picture of Roosevelt in his braces. Roosevelt was uh, not necessarily the most moral man in the world in many respects, but it never was reported in the papers. It was a different standard. That wasn't your right to know. Your right to know was what his policies were and what his government intended to do. But who said you had a right to know? In today's world, everyone has a right to know. And in having the right to know, not only is the right to privacy destroyed, but we live in a society that tears itself apart. <laughs> that it's impossible, I often feel, why would anyone ever, why, for, you know, Abraham Lincoln has a story about a, uh, a man from Illinois who uh, was caught stealing. And in frontier justice, uh, they did not delay very long. So they took him and they 
poured a bucket of tar of pitch over him and they dipped him in a barrel full of feathers and they tied him to a rod and they carried him out of town and they threw him in a swamp. And it, Lincoln said he was heard to remark on the way out that if it were not for the honor, he would forego the pleasure. <laughs> if it were not for the honor, why in the world should anyone in his right mind attempt to have public office today? Why should anyone attempt to expose oneself to the right to know of society? Because ain't sadik bars asher yaset ovelo yechto. There are no perfect people. Not this time around. And because of that idea, so the whole idea of confidentiality has been destroyed. And I want to discuss confidentiality in three areas, and then I will be done. The Rambam in Hilchus Deus says, famous Rambam. A Zehu Rochil. Who is a Rochil? Rochil Rechilus is slandering. But the origin of the word Rochil in Hebrew, Reish Chof Yud Lamed, is a peddler. A Rochil. A peddler. Someone that travels with goods from place to place and sells them. So the Rambam explains Zehu Toein Dvorim, the man packs up on his back, the Rambam says, stories. He's got stories about people. And he goes from one person to another, or from one town to another. The Omer, and he says, You know what Yankel said? You know what I heard that they say about Yankel? The Rambam says everything that he says is true. That's the Lushan of the Rambam. Destroys society. Society cannot exist that way. Society cannot exist with the right to know about everybody else's business. Society is built on privacy, on intimacy, on confidentiality. Bilam said, Matovu Alecha Yaakov. So Rashi says, What did he see? The greatness of Alecha Yaakov, that everybody's entrance to the tent did not face their neighbor's entrance to the tent. That's Matovu Alecha Yaakov. You couldn't look into somebody else's kitchen. Yesh Ovon Godom is there, the Rambam says. There's an even greater sin than this type of Rechilus. Ad Ma'od, great, great sin. Vuhu Loshon Hora. That is what we call speaking Loshon Hora. What is the definition? Hu Amisaper Bignus Chavero. Someone that says negative things about someone else. Afal Pisha Omer Emes. Again, even though what he says is true. Avul ba loshon oroze she yoshe viomer of the the man that says loshon oro and he says kach vekacho saploni this is what Yankel did kach vekacho yavosov this and this what his fathers were kach vekach shomati olov this is his reputation vomer dvorim shalignai and he says negative things alze akosu vomer the posig and the healing says, Yichro Sashem Kol Sifse Chalokos, may the Rabon Shalom cut off all smooth-talking lips, Loshon Medaberes Gedolos, a tongue that speaks great Averis. Well, that's the rule. That's the balance. That's where we start from. And that has nothing to do with a professional. That has to do with everybody. The ability not to say things about people. The Gemara tells us a story. Ahu Talmido the Nofagale Kola, the Gole Milsad Itmer Bay Midrosha, Bosser Chov Bay's Shnin. Twenty two years ago, there was a matter that came up in the yeshiva, in the base Madrash, and they had a meeting, and they came to a decision. Twenty two years later, one of the participants in the meeting revealed 
What happened at the meeting? 22 years later, Rav Ami Afkei Medrosha. Rav Ami sent them away, fired him from the yeshiva. Omar, he said, Dein Gole Rosa. He is someone who can't keep a secret. Can't keep him here. Next time you read revisionist history books, memoirs. 22 years later, he says, no, that's, that's not, it's not the role model that we want in the yeshiva. We don't want him here. The Rabbeinu Yonah and the Shari Tshuva says, Chayav Odom Lahastir Asod Asher Yigleilo. A person is obligated, even if the other person doesn't tell you. Somebody comes and tells you an intimate story. And he doesn't say in confidence. He just tells it to you. Are you allowed to go out and tell it? So the Rabbeinu Yonah says no. Ki yesh begilu yasod nezek By revealing the secret, you damage people. You may undo what he hopes to accomplish. And it's not part of the modesty of the Jewish people. And you go against the man that told it to you, even though he didn't tell you not to. But we understand that when people tell a secret, they intend that it should remain secret. Allah has come of a comma, a doctor. One of the great uh, progress uh, signs that I see in medicine, I happen to have to uh, be in NYU Cornell Medical Center in New York, New York Medical Center in New York, Cornell, and in the elevator there's a sign, and the sign is, doctors and nurses, please do not discuss patients in the elevator. There must have been a good malpractice suit that put that sign up. You're not allowed to talk about others. You're not allowed to say things about others. That's the balance. That's the Yosiso Hayosho Vahato. But my friends, in the world of balance, there are exceptions. And the exceptions are very important to note. A true case that I know of a colleague of mine, a uh, very, very big Talmud Chacham. A young man came to him, and he confessed to him that he is a murderer. A murderer. And he confessed to him that at times he has urges that are very hard to control and that he is capable of murder. So my friend, the rabbi, the colleague, turned them in. And he was convicted, and he is serving a very long prison sentence. Was the rabbi right, or was the rabbi wrong? Wait, well, you can't say, like, if you know the answer, then what am I here for, right? <laughs> Second case, there's a great article in the second volume of Tchumin, which is a uh, collection of articles uh, by uh, young, mostly younger Rabbonim here in Eretz Yisrael on practical shy lists. It's a marvelous rabbinic journal. And this is so Rabbi Shlomo Aviner has an article there, Religious Kibbutz, so the rule in the kibbutz is that before you can become a member of the kibbutz, they have to vote you in. And they have a meeting, and at the meeting, this guy gets up and he says, you know, I think that Yanko should be voted in because, you know, they're, they're bad. A guy gets up and he says, I don't think Yanko should be here at all. You know, I, in fact, I heard, you know, that Yanko is this and this and this. Is such a meeting allowed, I'll be halacha? Is such a procedure allowed? Are religious kibbutzim allowed to follow such a way of induction of membership? Third case happens 
very, very often. Today it's so widespread that it's an epidemic. It's called Shiduchim. He's going to check her out. You know what that means? I like the good old days. You know, my wife and I got married. We're still checking each other out. <laughs> it's more interesting that way. Right? You're going to check her out. Calls up. He says, I'm going out with Rachel. I'm interested in going out. What do you know about Rachel? And the guy says, tells him, or the girl tells him, or the mother tells him. Everything she knows about how you is it allowed? What are you? On the other hand, what if you know that Rachel is a kleptomaniac? Or what if you know that Rachel has a very, very serious mental and emotional problem? Or what if you know that Rachel's father is a horse thief? Can you just walk away from this poor, unsuspecting bloke who's about to get married, you know, and with all of these problems that are being hidden from him, where is the balance? Fourth case, you meet somebody on the street, a good friend of yours, and you say, you know, Yankel, what are you doing? He says, I'm going into a new business. Well, you go into a new business, what business? He tells you the business, he says, you know who I'm going with? And he tells you the name of his partner. You know that his partner is a con man. You know his partner is a thief. You know his partner is someone that cannot be trusted. He didn't ask you any advice. He didn't call you before and say, shall I go with this partner? What are your responsibilities? So here we have the balance which I began with and that I'm ending with. The balance is one side we have a posik vasisa yoshor vato ben Hashem elokecha, and we have a halacha that loshen hora is not allowed even if it's the truth, and the right to privacy is protected beyond all question. On the other side we have a posik as we always have in the Torah. For every posik on one side you have one on the other. Lo samod al dam reach. You shall not stand idly by and watch your friend be destroyed. And therefore, the halacha is that in these types of cases, he wants to become a member of the kibbutz. I know that if he's a member of the kibbutz, it'll be the most disruptive thing that ever happened to the kibbutz. I have to get up and say he should not be a member of the kibbutz. I know that this girl has these and these problems. I have to tell him. I know that his partner is someone that cheats and steals. I'm duty bound to tell him because of the posseg of Los Amor al Dam So where is the line? So I don't want to posk in any shyness here, but I just want to give you a few guidelines that the Chofetz Chaim mentions in his great work on Lushan Hara. He says there are three exceptions to this rule of confidentiality. One is public danger, the murderer case. You let a murderer walk the street when you know that he's a murderer. You know that this doctor is a terrible doctor. He's a surgeon, he's inept, his hands shake. For instance, uh, when I was in the OU, we had many times, you know, people came and said, you know, this sheikh, he's now at an age where his hand shakes, right? So the khalif shakes every time. So he's a great guy, but he can't be a sheikh anymore. There's public danger, public good. The second exception is private danger, business, shiduchi. The third one is communal damage, the kibbutz. The shul, this person will become the president, it'll be a disaster. You notice I never elevated to the rabbi. <laughs> so those are the three areas that the Chofetz Chaim says that this rule of Losamor al Damriacho applies. Chofetz Chaim says, A, 
everything that you say has to be something that you personally know. You cannot say hearsay. You can't say, Yankel says that Shimon is a thief. If you know he's a thief, then you can say it. B, you cannot say anything in exaggeration. Just because he's a thief doesn't mean he's a murderer. <clears throat> Just because he does this doesn't mean he does that. What you say has to be limited exactly to what he is. The third thing the Chofetz Chaim says, if you hear rumors about a person, you're allowed to take the rumors into account. You're not necessarily, uh, let us say, allowed to believe those rumors, but you're allowed to take it into account. You have to, you have to, so to speak, have a brain in your head. And then the Chofetz Chaim says the hardest of all the rules, that he means you should mean it l'shem shamayim and not be an enemy of the person. You have to be able somehow to differentiate within yourself where my personal feelings begin and where I'm really talking about the public good or the private good. To be able to analyze yourself before you're able to analyze somebody else. And finally the Chofetz Chaim says that it's permissible only if your opinion will make a difference. Sometimes I, uh, one of the great jobs of a Rosh Hashiva is that his Talmudim get married. So there are some boys that come and ask before. There are some boys who come and ask during. Most come and ask after. After, it's pretty late. He's not going to listen to you. Then you have to judge. After he's given her the ring, and he's met her parents, and the invitations are printed, and he's wildly in love with her, and you're going to tell him, you know, I don't think she's for you. <coughs> it's not likely to go down well. It's not likely to be believed, and to be taken into account. And Chofetz Chaim says that unless you have a very, very good chance of being listened to. So then, one should not say anything. Because then again, we have lost the balance. So here we have this road of confidentiality, this road that is protected by the Torah over all everything else, over anyone else's right to know, is my right that no one should know. And we have some of the exceptions that appear in halacha. I end as I began. The great posek is able to judge. He's able to know, Hashem imo, halacha kamosa b'chol makom. What shall I say in this case? And just as people ask a shayla to their rov, they ask a question about food and about kashras and about the eriv and about all sorts of other things which are important, this is also important. If you have a shy of whether I should tell regarding a shidduch or not, you have to ask somebody. It's not simple that you should tell. It's not simple that you should not tell. And because of this attempt that we have to find the balance in life. Finally, the Chofetz Chaim says that deep down in our hearts, we are the best judge of what is confidential and what is professional. And I think that that's true. Most of the time in life we don't listen to ourselves. We listen to what the world has to say. We listen to what everybody else has to say. What will they think? What will they... A million things impinge upon us. But if we pull off all the layers that cover our own heart, the great heart of each and every Jew, the heart that everyone wants to be the servant of the Rabboni Shalom, that everyone wants to follow in his footsteps, that everyone wants to do atove ayosha, what is right and what is good. There's no one that sets out in life to be a rosha, God forbid. Everyone follows to the extent that they are led on the path that life takes them. So if we we'll listen to ourselves privately and in confidence, so then many times that serves to be the best and uh, most uh, 
beneficial remedy to our ills and to our character. That requires a few moments of privacy, my friends. I notice in the United States, where television is on 24 hours a day, and where it never stops, you can shop now 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, never closes. So you can go through life in our society never having been with yourself for a moment after a certain age, 12, 13, 15. Never. You come home from work, you watch the news, you watch the television, you fall asleep, you get up in the morning, you go to work, all right? You watch the Chicago Bulls, and you know, you're always busy. You never have a moment for yourself. What do you say? What do you say? That requires that still small moment of privacy, of confidence, of self-analysis. The Bali Musser, who never demanded more than what people can give, so Rabbi Yisrael Salanter has in his notebook that a person should give himself ten minutes before he goes to sleep at night. So his Talmud, Rabbi Zalapetterberger, said the Rebbe could give ten minutes. He said, I can only do it for five minutes. We may only be able to do it for 15 seconds. But the 15 seconds is also important. It's the difference. It allows us to follow in the footsteps that are Rabboni Shalom. It allows us to be Mekayim the Posik, Vosisa, Ayoshur, Vatov, Bene Hashem Elokecha. And it rewards us both in this world and in the next. I thank you for your courtesy. I'd like to thank the organization for allowing me to speak here in Yerushalayim. We should be Zoha always to Yeshua and Nachomas. Thank you. It's superfluous, I think, to offer thanks, but we do offer the prayer that Rabbi Wein will be able to be Malbit's Torah in Yerushalayim and throughout the world, and that we will be among those privileged to hear it. We will accept, or Rabbi Wine has offered to accept questions or comments. I am going to set the limit at 9.30. It is now 9.20. And at 9.30, there will be a minion for Myriv in the corner over here. So those of you who wish to stay for Myriv are welcome to do so. Uh, there will be a 10-minute period allowed for questions and answers. And I'll give the floor to directly to Rabbi Wine. Uh, sufficiently intimidated by now not to require questions and answers. But if you want, I'll be happy to join you. Yes? Concerning the problem of previous rabbis, yes. what do you do in a case like this? Uh, the, the, friend, the woman wants to have her baby, and she, uh, she doesn't have the money and so on. Why can't she have the baby and give it to, a, to the many uh, how a couple who want children and can't have them? I have a, a couple, a friend, a, a couple who are friends of mine, and they couldn't have children. And so they went to a certain uh, organization here that handles this, and for some reason, they don't know why, they were refused. He has a good job, they have a, a, a stable ha household, etc., etc. I thought uh, we would want that they were refused. Why don't they give these, have the woman to have her baby and give it to these people. I am certain that there are such instances that do occur. I, uh, there are many. I am certain that there, that there are such possibilities. <laughs> yes? In the presidential race in the United States, people are looking very carefully at the Democratic candidate, and the rationale is that if he's capable of personal immorality, is this the type of person who, when faced with moral decisions governing an entire nation, will also be lacking. Do you think that's inappropriate? I think that it's appropriate that there be moral candidates. I don't... Uh, I really don't think... Uh, I know how to put it, uh, that it should sound uh, as callous as it's going to sound. But in the history of leadership, both in the United States and in other countries in the world, it does not play the role that the press ascribes to it. I mean, no, see, again, it's, it's a question of definition. The United States is a very funny place. Uh, the definition, we want our president to be our high priest. 
we want our president to be the Pope. We want our president to be something that, and yet to become president, you cannot become president under the current conditions uh, uh, if you're that type of person or personality. We would like a non-political politician. <laughs> we would like a, uh, a person that's very skilled in, diplo in diplomacy but yet never tells a non-truth. I mean, you're looking for something that doesn't exist. And therefore, uh, this itself is part of the hypocrisy of the situation. I uh, don't advocate that Clinton should be an immoral person, God forbid. And his immorality does not sit well with me, and I, I'm sure it does not help him with the electorate. But to say that he is disqualified from the office that Warren G. Harding held, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not ready to say that. That's part of the balance, all right? Yes. Regarding confidentiality. Well, well, wait, wait, wait. Well, she asked, isn't it not better to say, I don't know, when you do know? Uh, the Chofetz Chaim in, the, uh, in his Sefer discusses that exact question. If the person will listen to you, and you know it of your own knowledge, and you are saying it without any personal animosity, then one should say the facts rather than saying, I don't know. If the situation does not meet those criteria, you heard a lot of rumors, but you don't know or uh, you know the person may not listen to you, or probably won't listen to you. So then the Chavetz Chaim says it is better to say, I don't know. But if that, if that person knows that you do know the person well, and if you say, I don't know, isn't that an answer? Well, it depends how smart the other person is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I'm a teacher in a public high school. And often my students come to me with prefacing their stories with, please don't tell my parents, they'll kill me if they know. And often, the, I am, I listen to the stories, and I know these are some, something the parents have to know. I sometimes can go to the guidance counselors. Our guidance counselors are not always the people who are the right ones to tell. But what do I do in cases like that? I mean, I've always tried to do the best I can and, and, and find the right people as intermediaries, but I know in, in many cases they're young, they're misguided, their parents should know, but I know what would happen if their parents found out. Well, I don't know, I don't, I mean, if what will happen when the parents find out will not rectify the situation, then uh, then you don't gain anything. But but where it, uh, it would rectify the situation. <laughs> So then, uh, you know, then uh, that that, you know, that's that's the terrible dilemma. But I think you would have to take something to it. I think, by the way, with young people, my opinion, again, based only on 20 years of trial and error in the yeshiva, more error than trial. Well, a lot of trial too. But when they tell it to you, they want you to tell their parents. You are the conduit. Otherwise, that's what they're using you for. And to a certain extent. To a certain extent, they're crying out to you, and uh, I think that you have to be able to read the child, read the circumstance every time. You can't give a general rule, but you have to be able to read the circumstance. Yes? Is there any reason to be more lenient in marriage between a man and his wife? You mean to discuss lotion horror with your wife? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know of no heter to discuss what is also to discuss with someone else. I know of no heter to discuss with your wife either. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, somebody mentioned here about, uh, you know, not saying the whole truth. There is such an element in halacha too. We find it in the Torah that when... Uh, Sora Imenu, when she was told that she was going to have a child at the age of 90, so she laughed. And not only did she laugh, 
She said, and even I'm 90 if I have the child, but Vadoni Zokain, Avram's an old man. Who's going to fix him up? <laughs> when God repeated the conversation to Avram, he left out the part that she said, Vadoni Zokain. Because Avraham would have been hurt by it that his wife said he was an old man. So from there, I'm mean, just I'm going to show you how Jews approach something, right? How do Jews deal with God? So therefore, the Gemara Darshan's from there that a person can be Mishane Bidiburo Mipnayasholom. A person doesn't have to say the whole truth in order to preserve Sholom. So if you want to make Sholom between two people. You don't have to quote verbatim what the other person said about him. <laughs> and then go back and say, well, he really said it, aren't you? You have to, you're, you're part of, that's the Yosisa Yosher Vatov. God does Yosisa Yosher Vatov. So, uh, in that respect, uh, you know, there may be conversations that you can use, you know, it depends what your purpose is, where it leads. I thank everybody uh, for uh, your courtesy. <laughs>